<laughs> it's okay. It is now recording. Okay, and and the, the stuff that is written, it is already recorded as well. So I can actually give you guys the the um, uh, this stuff here. This is all written. All right. So I do apologize that I forgot to click the record button. <clears throat> It was easier when I used Zoom because Zoom automatically start recording as soon as the session is on. But if I use Zoom, people keep asking, can I just join Zoom remotely? And I don't want to answer those questions. <laughs> I suppose I can always just answer no. You know, but... Can I join the OBS remotely? Hmm? Say, can I join the OBS remotely? Yeah, I don't think OBS has, a, has that ability. <laughs> Unless you want to live stream to Twitch. Twitch. Yep. Yeah, I used to do that. I used to live stream OBS to YouTube directly, but I don't do that anymore. All righty. So we are now getting back to this, into the thick of, of this. Okay, do you guys still remember, you know, how we went through this calculation? Okay, did anyone actually go through the math, you know, of these derivation? Because I went through the left hand side. You know, what you can do is just to go through the right hand side. And the best way to understand all this stuff here is to use a concrete value. So you want to use a concrete value for x so that it is the else value that's going to take into, that's going to be effective, which means you want to make this false, which means your x has to be an even number. So if you plug in x being, say, 4, then it would become pretty obvious of how all of these steps can occur. Okay, so next time you see something that's super abstract, because you will see something super abstract in your future classes as well. So the, the idea is, okay, let's make it less abstract by substituting actual values. Then after you plug in the values, you can actually expand it, and then you can visualize what's happening with all of these you know, sigma notation and how we can combine the sigma notation you know, in this particular way. So that's just a, it's just a trick, okay? You know, one thing that I do myself when I read something that's really abstract with lots of symbols, then I plug in actual values and see what it looks like after I plug in the values. Alrighty, so the next thing we want to do is to say, um, that's great because now we have just figured out a way to come up with the natural number corresponding to the base of the entire, you know, space, okay? So let me show you, you know, what that means. You know, I can just pop up the, um, the notes from last time, but I will do something better. Okay, so what I'll do is I'm going to the folder of this class. Okay, so let me change the sorting again back to here. So this means, you know, whatever, I, whatever I'm doing right now is something that you can see right now on your device if you're already um, in... Um, in Google right now. So what I'll do is I'm going to new, use uh, start a new spreadsheet, okay. and I'll call this one um, G values. Okay. All right. So what I want to do is to say, okay, you know, so in this particular spreadsheet, the way we fill in the values, so you, you don't have to copy it because I'm going to turn everything into equations. So this is 0, this is 1, this is 2, this is 3, 4, 5, and then I would make this one 6, 7, 8, 9, and so on. Okay. In other words, all I'm doing here is doing exactly the same thing that I did last time, except it is upside down. Is that okay? Now, the question is, am I going to spend eternity to fill in you know, this entire page? Okay, this brings up one interesting question. Um, there was a student on, I think it was yesterday, so on, on Tuesday, asking me, you know, um, what is the best way to uh, motivate oneself to get into programming and to actually look into, you know, uh, coding and stuff like that? And my answer was laziness. Okay, but why, why do you think that was my answer? To automate things, exactly, okay? Because programming is about automation, okay? So if I see a tedious task that I do not want to do, I want to think about how to automate it so that I don't have to do the task. So it's the same thing here. If I want to fill this entire page of these values, 
I go like, I don't want to do that. I mean, that's really kind of it's really tedious. So I want to figure out a way to do this using、um, Excel, or not Excel, but the spreadsheet equations. So how many people are familiar with how to use formulae within a spreadsheet? Just a little bit. A little bit, okay. Okay, this is actually like super easy. Okay, so the zero I cannot get away. With, well, I can actually get away with this one too. So what I need to do is to、uh, give it an expression to do this. Okay, all right. So this is a.、Uh, okay, so there's a function called row, you know, and it returns the row number, which starts with one, and then there's also another、uh, function called column, which returns the column number. So column A is actually column one, column B is column two, and so on. So now the question is, how do I make use of these functions in order to autofill the values? Okay, so that's kind of my question.、Um, based on the discussion last time, we basically start with this particular thing, which is a zero. This is zero plus one. This is the previous column plus two, and so on. So if I just force a value here, and then I can now say if you are call If the previous column is column one, then we are just adding this value with the column number of the same previous column. Does that make sense? Sorta. Of. So I want to see if this works with the next cell. Okay. Ah, it works on the next cell, and then I want to see if it works on the next one. Okay, we'll fill up the bottom row here. So now we double check. Zero、uh, plus one is a one. One plus two is a three. Three plus three is a six. Six plus four is an eight. Eight plus I mean ten plus five is fifteen. Fifteen plus six is twenty-one, and so on. So that seems to get the the whole thing working. So the question is, what about the other cells, right? You know, so today we'll talk about how to work with the other cells. What is the systematic way to fill in the other cells? Like, what about this one? Well, this one is going to be this value plus one. This is going to be this value plus one. So we are now looking at diagonal stuff, right? So this value is this value plus one, and so on. Now, is there a way to do this? Yeah, there's a way to do it. You can always just say that this cell has a value of whatever this one is plus one, and then you know, that relationship maintains throughout all of these things.、Uh, there's a one here because this cell does not have a value yet. So Because you know, the, we really do not have an infinite space here, so if I want to get this one working, you know, now it works. What about this one here? Same deal, right? This is the value of this value plus one. So now I can actually just become super lazy and go like, doo -doo 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 -doo. and you know, because you know, over here,、um, it, it, eventually it doesn't work because you know, I have empty cells over here. That's the reason why it you know. It's not working. Yep. Can you do the、uh, instead of doing that, doing like the row before? So like two would loop back to zero plus the row number. Plus the row number. Plus well, the you row have、number. to find out which base. Okay. So I know what you're talking about. So let's say we pick this number here, and then we say, okay, this is really just、uh, whatever number is at the base, which is. This is the base, right? So now you have to figure out what is the base, you know, of this particular value, and then add the y value to it. So you're correct. We can do it that way. So we are now getting back to the equation because you're based on this observation. Observation. If I know where a cell is, I can. If I have a way to go back to the base of that cell, then I can just add the y coordinate to get to the value of the cell. Okay, so I just mumble. I just mentioned a lot of you know, mumble jumbo. What did that mean? You probably understood every single word of that, <laughs> but what does that mean? Okay, so there are a few keywords here. What diagonal line are we talking about? Okay, that's the first question. Two, what is the base of the diagonal line? And three, what is the y coordinate? Those are the, all the questions that you should be you know, asking in your head. It's like, what is he talking about? What diagonal line? What diagonal lines are we talking about? Okay, so the best way to describe that. Okay, let me see if I can use another representation. Yep. Quick question. Sorry to interrupt, but I didn't see the bar from the top of the column. Do you 
still, uh, yeah, the clock doesn't. Um, right? I'm still recording. Okay, cool. Yeah, it's just that the clock is not showing. Let me get back here and make the clock reappear. Always on top. There we go. All right, so getting back to this here. Okay. So let's go back and talk about what diagonal lines we are talking about. All right, so we started off, you know, filling this as zero, right? And then we have this one as one, this one as two. This is one diagonal line. So when you look at your one, two, that is a diagonal line. So let me use a different color to indicate this is the diagonal line in that direction. And then we go back to here. We've got three, four, and five. That is another diagonal line going like this. And then the next one is going to be six, seven, eight, nine. And once again, it is a diagonal line. Is that okay? So the question is, if I have a particular cell sitting all the way out here, how do I know which diagonal line it belongs to? Now, why do I want to know which diagonal line it belongs to? Because if you look at you know, things on the diagonal line, they have, you know, uh, they, they are, the, the value is just based on what is at the base of the diagonal line plus the y value. Because this one has a y value of 2. This is the base of the diagonal line. So 6 plus 2 is the natural number corresponding to that particular cell. This cell, the cell with a value of 8, has a coordinate of 1, 3. The base of the diagonal line has a coordinate of um, 3, 0. Is that okay? So the next thing we want to do is to say, okay, so how do we identify the base of a diagonal line given a particular coordinate? All right, so do, to do that, we'll switch to yet another screen. Okay, so this time we are going to use um, this cell has a coordinate of 0, 0. Okay, this cell here has a coordinate of 1, 0. This one is 0, 1. This cell over here is 2, 0. This cell is 1, 1. This cell is 0, 2. We'll do one more diagonal line, and then you guys should notice the pattern. So once again, we are trying to identify a pattern. Because once we identify a pattern, then we go like, oh, OK, so there's a systematic way to figure things out. And this one is, what, uh, 0 for x, 3 for y. So what do you notice about things that are on the same diagonal line. This is one single diagonal line by itself. This is one. This is another one. This is yet another one. What do you notice? Yep. The addition of their coordinates gives you the diagonal. It gives, it's the same number. Okay, it is the same number. Okay, so that defines what a quote unquote diagonal line is. So now I can say, okay, let's do another definition. I love definitions because you know, definitions will give us a very precise and concise way to describe something. So I'm going to describe, you know, um, I'm using the wrong color. So back, back. There we go. There we go. So I'm going to define uppercase D of N to be a set where we have X, Y as, uh, as a tuple, as every element, but we have constraints on the X, Y. So we want x to be a part of natural numbers. We want y to be an element of natural numbers. And on top of that, we also want x plus y to be exactly the same as n. So now we have defined a new notation, okay? Uppercase D because it's diagonal, okay? D stands for diagonal. So now, let me ask you this. What about D of, okay, 6? Just give me a few elements that are in this particular set. Six zero. Six zero. Okay, that's a good choice. Oops. There we go. Five one. Five one. Okay. <coughs> Four two. I mean, it gets boring. Da 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 da. And then the last one is will probably be zero six in this particular order. 
right? So are we doing okay so far with this new definition of uppercase D of a natural number, in this case, 6? So these are the coordinates belonging to the same diagonal line. Is that okay? So now we have a way to identify, hey, if you give me a coordinate, I know what diagonal line it belongs to. But that also means I have a way to get to the base of the diagonal line. Does that make sense? Okay. So let's go ahead and use an example. Okay. So we'll go ahead and work out a particular example. So let's just say I want to find out what natural number would correspond to um, 7, 9. Okay. Yeah, so in other words, I want to find out what is g of that value. Okay. I know what diagonal line it belongs to. Okay. So we know 7, 9 is an element of big D of 7 plus 9, which is what? 16, right? Okay. Do we know how to get to the base of you know, 16 out? Okay. So if you think about what this means, this is diagonal line 0, D of 0. These two are D of 1. These three are D of 2. These th four are D of 3. And then we have D of 4 going here. Okay, so this is the base of D of 4, D of 5, D of 6, D of 7, D of 8, D of 9, D of 10, and so on. So what do you think is the natural number, is the natural number corresponding to this coordinate here? which is 0, 16. Because 0, 16 is the base of this diagonal line. So what would that what would be that value? Now we worked on the closed form in the previous class on Monday. So what was the conclusion on Monday? Okay, so let's let's re revisit the sigma notation on Monday. If I want to add 0 up to x, and I'm just adding 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, all the way up to x, this is x times x plus 1, the whole thing divided by 2. That was the result of the derivation on Monday. Is that okay? Yep. I got a question about, is it 16? Is it 16 given today? Um, you are correct. It is the other way around. It is 16, 0. Thank you. Very good. So, so that means, you know, it is 16 times 17, the whole thing divided by 2. Okay, so that would be the value for just the base here. But since we know the coordinate 7, 9 is along this line here, and it is 9 cells up, right? So all we have to do is to add the y coordinate, which is the 9, to 16 times 17, the whole thing divided by 2. That becomes the natural number corresponding to this particular value, or this particular coordinate. Is that okay? Well, let's plug it in and see if it works, right? Because you know, we really want to double check things. So we'll just pick uh, some unfortunate coordinate here. Let's pick this guy. <laughs> what what is the coordinate of this uh, cell over here? You know, converting to zero oriented you know, coordinates. So let's count. Okay, what is the x co y x coordinate? This is zero, one, two, three, four, five. Okay, so we have five as the x coordinate. What about the y coordinate? We have uh, row zero, one, two, three, four. So it is 5, 4 as a coordinate. So now that we know it is 5, 4, let's switch back to the kind of the scratch work in your paste place here. So 5, 4 is an element. Okay, let me start a new page. So now we say 5, 4 is an element of the diagonal line of 9. It is diagonal line 9 because as we scan, you know, like this, it will be, you know, number 9. So this implies uh, the g value you know, or the natural number corresponding to um, 9, 0 is going to be what? I'm trying to see if you can make connections between all the things that we have talked about. So 9, 0 is the base of diagonal line number 9. Okay. 
And it comes out to be 45. 45. What is, yep, it is 9 plus 9 plus 1, the whole thing divided by 2, which is 45. Okay, so now we know the natural number corresponding to the base of the, of the diagonal line that 5, 4 as a coordinate belongs to. Are we doing okay so far? Yep. It is a multiplication. It should be multiplication. Sorry. There you go. So 9 times 10 is 90. 90 divided by 2 is 45. Okay, so yes. Thank you for the correction. Um, but the cell that we are interested in is four cells or four rows on top of you know, the base. So that means if I just add four to this, that will give us the answer of 49. So we'll see if we have the same answer over there. So we'll go back to the spreadsheet and it is 49 indeed. So is that okay so far? So this means we have a very systematic way to find the natural number given a particular coordinate. So now if I go back here, I can now say, okay, you can give me any coordinate, okay? X is the column number, Y is the row number. It is just X plus Y times X plus Y plus one. Oops, okay, I said one thing and wrote down something else. Divided by two. That will give you the natural number at the base of that diagonal line. We just have to add y to get to the cell that we are interested, interested in. So that's the equation. Do we have any questions about this equation or how it is derived? The equation itself is not as important because you can look it up. There's actually a specific name for this way of arranging the natural numbers. I cannot remember anymore, but somebody said, hey, Tech, you're not the first one who came up with this idea. I know I'm not the first one. But then that person actually named the, uh, you know, the method of arranging things like this, which I cannot remember anymore. Yep? I'm just curious to know, you got DS9 by adding those two together, the X9, or did you get it because that's the same as the Say that one more time. The, the 9, what did you get the first one? Did 5 plus 4. Yeah, because you know, everything in diagonal line 9 would have the coordinates added up, you know, adding to 9. And at the base, you would have you know, 9, 0 as the coordinate. And we have a way to calculate the natural number at the base of each diagonal line already. So that's what we're doing is we first figure out the natural number at the base of the diagonal line. And then we just add the y coordinate in order to get to, in order to scan you know, sideways to the uh, to the element that we are, to the coordinate that we are interested in. Alrighty. So, the next thing is, are we really sure this is gonna work out? So now we go back to the spreadsheet. The nice thing about the spreadsheet is it gives people who like to have some kind of hands-on ex uh, hands um, example to work on, okay? So for people who really like to know how do we come up with a number, this gives you know, those people a particular tool to visualize things and also to look at the, the actual equation to get things done. So now it is a little bit kind of hairy because you know everything needs to, I need to subtract one from the row number and also the column number. So uh, row uh, minus one, this is my y value. So we should probably start with column first. This is my x and then this is my y, and then this has to multiply by kind of itself plus one. So column minus one plus row minus one plus one. Yes, I know I could have you know, written it in a slightly different way, but I want to do it this way because um, this reflects you know, uh, x plus y on this side. This reflects x plus y plus one, and then the whole thing divided by two, and then plus the y value which is this row number uh, minus one. All right, okay, we got zero back. This is a really long and complicated way to get zero, but we wanna see if this works with all the different cells. So we're gonna do the same trick over here, and then you'll just kinda of expand it all the way down, do, 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 like that, and scroll back. So we can at least compare a few ones of the ones that we have worked out already. 
So let's pick uh, this 72, which is F7. And then we look at this 72. It is also F7. So I'm fairly sure that I got the you know, equation right. And you have access to this spreadsheet already right now at this point. It is called G values. It is in the shared folder that is already linked from Canvas. Is that helping? I mean, I'll be kind of getting the idea of how to you know, come up with the equation and also get a visual of how the equation works. Okay. All right. And you can see how spreadsheets are useful because you know, a spreadsheet allows you to kind of put in the equations and then you can just let it do the calculations and you can actually see the visualization of how the values relate to you know, other values on the same spreadsheet. Could you describe how this relates to alpha null? Huh? Could you describe how this relates to alpha null? How this relates to aleph null? Aleph null? Yeah. Oh, okay. I like that question. Okay, the question was, how does this relate to Aleph Null? Well, we want to know, okay, so let me go back to the handwritten notes here. This is the question. The question is, what is the cardinality of this thing, Cartesian product with itself? That was the original question, right? So the question is, is this really the same thing as Aleph Null? So I have to be, did I do this quickly, right? Or is it the other way? Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. We'll just say that it's yeah. correct. <laughs> so that's the question. Okay, so getting back to what you're asking, that is the question. So what, what do I need to do to confirm that, yes, the cardinality of the Cartesian product between natural numbers and natural numbers is indeed out of note. What do I need to do? That relates back to the discussion of functions, right? Exactly what about functions do we need to use in this case? What wasn't it that we were trying to find out uh, the way to make a unique value for every single bit inside of the natural? Claim. Yes, but the more precise way to de describe it is, can we find a bijection between the Cartesian product of natural number with natural number to natural number? Can we find that bijection? Let me write it here, yeah, because the notation is important as well. So we want to, this is what we find, want to find. So we want to find a G so that the domain is the Cartesian product between natural num and number and natural number, but we want it to map to just natural number. And G is a bijection. So the question is, does G exist? Is that okay? So we are suspecting the G that we have here is satisfying that requirement. That's a suspicion. I have not proven it yet. So is that okay? You know, I really like those questions because sometimes you know, you know, we're so deep into the itty gritty de detail of the discussion, you know, the mechanics of things that you know, sometimes we lose sight of. You know, why are we even talking about this? So are we are we good? are we okay now? I mean, are we okay? All right. So that's the question. Does this, is this particular G function a bijection? So now we have to say, okay, so what is a bijection again? Yes, so a bijection is a function that is both injective and surjective. What does injective mean? Do you guys remember the uh, the picture of the dots you know, going across? So what is the injection? Go ahead. Injection is when uh, everything in the domain is not the unique element in the domain. That is correct. So everything is unique. No two elements of the domain should map to the same thing in the codomain. That is correct. So it, using this way of arranging the values of a cell, okay, let me go back to the spreadsheet because it's more visual 
using the spreadsheet you know, point of view. So using this particular method, where we are basically just laying tiles, right? You know, the way we lay tile is start with the corner, then the next diagonal line, and then the next diagonal line, and then the next diagonal line, and so on. So are you intuitively convinced that no two tiles should have the same number? Yes. Okay, because we are, we are incrementing the value every single time we lay a new tile, so that means we are not going to have two tiles of the same number. Okay, so that meets the requirement of being injective. So the next question is, do you think it is surjective? What is surjective? What does it mean? And when I know you guys know that. And then, I know the answer. Go ahead. Everything in the code domain is not to. Yep. So exactly. Uh, everything in the code domain is mapped to at least once. It doesn't have to be exactly one. You know, it can be twice. Okay. If you just want surjective, you know, one, twice, three times, they're all fine. But in order to be, in order for it to be injective, it can only be up to once. So if I want injective and surjective, it means everything in the domain needs to map to something in the codomain once and only once. Okay. So do you think this meets that requirement? If I give you an insanely large you know, natural number, do you think that it would correspond to one coordinate? Yeah. OK. All right. So that is the context. Okay. That's the context of why we are talking about this G function. And I chose this particular um, problem. OK. Let me go back to the slide here. I chose this specific problem, OK, because it looks, it looks weird, OK, because you're mapping something that's two-dimensional to something that is just one dimensional. It is worse than that mapping the integers into natural numbers because in that case, it's still it's linear, okay? you bi-directional linear versus unidirectional linear. And the trick to do it is, oh, we just fold it, but when we fold, we also double the distance. So that was the trick that we used to map integers onto natural numbers. This one is mapping two dimensional to one dimension. So it is not intuitive that we can actually establish this equality here. That it is actually, it has the cardinality of Aleph null. Is that okay? Are we, are we kind of establishing the context you know, after all the heavy duty math stuff here? Okay. Wait, hold on a second here. When we talked about bijection, we also talked about Hey, if some if a function is a bijection, it would also naturally have an inverse function. Do you guys remember that? Because if we can go in one direction, we should be able to go in the opposite direction. So now the question is, how do we reverse the direction in this case? We already have g being this, right? So the question is, how do I make g inverse so that given a natural number, I can go back and find the coordinate of the cell that contains that particular natural number. So that is the question. It's a very natural question because it logically you say, well, we know there has to exist a inverse function. The question is, how do I express the inverse function in closed form? Because you can always, okay, if you go back to the spreadsheet here, you can write a subroutine, right? You can write code to say, okay, give me any natural number, I will find you the coordinate because I would just keep laying tiles until, I f until that tile has this number. But that is not going to be a very fast algorithm, right? Because I can give you a huge number, and then you have to keep laying tiles, scanning you know, in vertical lines, until you actually get to that specific value. So our next challenge is to find the inverse function to this specific G function. The question is, how would you do that? That was a task that I gave myself you know, when I was you know, tasked to teach this class. I did not look up anything. I just derived the answer. You guys may be saying, but Tech, you are a professor and you have you know, all of these degrees. It has nothing to do with that. Okay? Because if you know your quadratic equation, you already have enough information to solve the puzzle. It is really just that. Okay? Algebra 2. 
Are we doing okay so far with kind of the context and where we're heading and why we are talking about this? Yep. So if you look at the top line where you solve it out in the upper line, mm -hmm. uh, your G is you breaking it down into a function, right? And then now you, you're saying you want to get the inverse of that same one? I'm trying to reverse the whole thing. So I what I want to do, okay, let me start a new cell here. So what I want to do is to say I want an inverse function of g where I can give it a in, you know, any integer number. So I will pick one that is probably on the uh, on the slide here, 321. I want to know what is the x coordinate and the y coordinate corresponding to that particular natural number. That's what I want to do. Now. You can always say, I would just write an algorithm because you know, I have taken CISB 360, 400, and 430 in this semester. I know how to write an algorithm to scan the whole thing until I find that particular value. It's not on this screen. That's okay because I can see how where this is going. This looks promising so, <laughs> because you know 323 is just 316 plus something, right? So I'm just going <laughs> to... This is brute force, but yeah, brute force sometimes works. So, da, 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 da. ah, right here, I can find it. But this is not a closed form. In other words, yes, I figure out that 321 as a natural number belongs to the pixel or the coordinate of 3, 21. Hmm? Sorry? Comma, yes. Yeah, so it's, it's 3, comma, 21. Yep. So we just have to split off the hundreds. <laughs> yep. You said 3, 21, so you're subtracting 1 from each. Sorry? You're subtracting 1 from each, right? Yes, because column D is actually 3, you know, column 3, because it's 0 oriented, the way we counted. And then row 22 should be row 20, row 22, should be 21 because you know the way the spreadsheet counts is it starts with one, but we should start with zero. But I cannot change the configuration of the spreadsheet to start counting from zero. All right. So the problem is, you know, if I give you a natural number, can you find me the coordinate of the cell that contains that number? So how would you solve that problem? Easy peasy. You just read my notes. Okay, I got it all figured out already. Right? So the question is, how do you follow that note? Now, I go through all of these things you know, because it is the process of finding the solution that is important. It is not the solution itself. Now, you, you just have to think about it this way. Okay? The way you, I would think about this is, how many people know about lead code? Okay, the website, you know, they, they, what, what does it do? Okay, let me let, have you guys to say, tell us. What what the, what is the code, L E E T code? Practice questions, right? Or you can look at it as practice questions. So lead code will give you problems to solve. So the question to, that I want to ask you is: Is it important for you to know the solution to a problem, or is it more important for you to know how to derive the solution given a problem? If you can only have one but not the other, which one would you have? How to derive. How to derive. Exactly. Okay. So the math here, I know this is not supposed to be a math class, but the reasoning is nonetheless similar. Okay. So we just look at patterns. That's what we are doing. So I'm just going to read out a little bit here. Okay. So to find the inverse function, we first have to find the diagonal line. So we have to find a diagonal line corresponding to um, a specific natural number. So what we also want to do is, because we don't know what the x and what the y is, we'll just say that when you add x and y, it becomes w. So why is w important in this case? Because we don't know what is x, we don't know what is y, right? But if I say you know x plus y, whatever x and y are supposed to be, if I add, add, add up those two, it is w. Then we can find the um, we can find we can have an expression that will tell us the natural number that we are given with 
has to be less than or equal to the base of the diagonal, the value at the base of the diagonal line that we are supposed to find. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, when it says we first have to find the diagonal line, does it mean the base of the diagonal line? Yes. Okay. Or you know, the number of the diagonal line using the big D notation. So we have to find out, you know, okay. it's an yeah. element of which diagonal line. I see. Okay. So we have to find this W. In other words, you know, now we have to solve for the largest W that is still less than or equal to N, given this is the constraint. Is that okay? Because you know, W can be very small, okay? You can always say, oh, we can solve this easily. Uh, w equals to one or zero, okay? If W equals to zero, yes, you have a solution. But it doesn't help us because it is not the diagonal line where the pixel that you're looking for is on. So we want to solve for the W that is the largest possible one, you know, and it is still less than or equal to N. Now, given this equation, you can use a loop, right? You can just you know, set up a loop. You say, what if W equals to zero? Do I meet this requirement? Yes. What if W equals to one? Yes, it still meets the requirement. You keep looping until W is exceeding, until this, the left-hand side of the inequality is larger than the right-hand side, then you go like, okay, we have to back up one step, now we find W. But that is also not a closed form. In other words, depending on what N is, it can still take a long time to find that W. Does that make sense? Because anytime you have a loop to find something, yes, it will find the answer, but not necessarily in a very efficient way. So we want the efficient way if we can find the efficient way. So. As it turns out, in this case, it's just a math thing, right? So now that we have this inequality, you basically just do your typical usual algebra stuff, okay? And we end up in this form, okay? So I hope these you know, four, the three steps of derivation is okay with you guys. Yes? So to find the view, why is it not equal to It's not equal to because we don't know what, what y is. Oh, you mean this less than or equal to? Yeah. Um, because this n is the natural number of a pixel that is somewhere along the diagonal line. Now, if that pixel is actually the base of the diagonal line, then yes, we would we would have a equal here. But on the other hand, if this n is corresponding to a natural number of anything other than the base of the diagonal line, then it's going to be greater than. Uh, w times w plus 1 divided by 2, because this value is the base of the diagonal line. It is the smallest value on that line. So that's why we have an inequality here. Okay? So, so the, you know, after a few derivation, the inequality becomes this, and then you just go like, okay, so if I look at this not as an inequality, but as a equality, then we can use a quadratic equation and we can solve your W to be minus one, which is the B over here, plus or minus, I mean, you guys know quadratic, quadratic equation, I don't have, have to explain that, but it has two solutions, right? You know, because you know, every time you look at a quadratic equation, it has two solutions, because you're looking at a parabola like this, okay, and you're, you're poking a, a horizontal line through the parabola, and then it will intersect at two points, okay? So now we have to say, but which point do we want? Well, we want the non-negative one. Because we know x plus y cannot be negative. Because x is a natural number, so is y. So x plus y has to be greater than or equal to 0. So now you look at this and go like, oh, so that means here negative 1 plus the square root of blah, blah, blah is the one that we want. Does that make sense? So we can toss away the other root of the quadratic equation because it doesn't apply to our problem. So now that we know how to do that, we have to take the floor of that because you know, the, the floor of the, the root has to be a natural number. W itself like this, you know, even if you toss away the negative answer, is not necessarily an, a natural number. It is, it's guaranteed to be a real number, but not uh, necessarily, a, necessarily a natural number. So we take the floor and not the ceiling because we want it to be the lower bound of... Um, the actual solution, because otherwise, you know, we are looking at an equality here. We need it to be less than or equal to. So the only way to, that we can guarantee that W is a 
natural number, but it is as large as it can get, is to take the floor of this root here. <coughs> Are we still doing okay so far? The real trick is to turn the whole thing into a quadratic inequality. And then after that, we use the floor function. Once we get the floor function, now we know what x plus y is supposed to be. Okay? Which is great, because this means we have found which diagonal line we are talking about. Okay? So once you have figured out which diagonal line we are talking about, we can find the value at the base of that diagonal line. Yes? Okay? So now, okay, just kind of, okay, let me, let me do the, uh, the picture thing. Um, there we go. All right, pen right there. Okay, so what we have done so far is you are given a value n, and you know, from n we can figure out what is w. w is x plus y. So what we have done so far is we have identified that this point here, which is w0, has a particular value, but we also know that the pixel that we are looking for is somewhere on this diagonal line. Is that okay? We know the g value of this thing is just w times w plus 1, the whole thing divided by 2, because the y coordinate at the base is 0. Okay? So now the question is comparing this value, because we know what w is, and you know the n that is somewhere on the diagonal line, I just need to count, oh, so n minus this whole thing is going to be the y coordinate. Is that making any sense? Yes. Because you know, the next cell on the diagonal line is going to be adding 1 to this, adding 2, adding 3, adding 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and so on. So now we can find the y. Once we find the y, how do we find the x? We, we have w already. What is w? W is x plus y. If we already know y, what y is, then x is just going to be w minus y. And we have the whole thing done, resolved. Is that OK? So yes, so if you read the notes, there is a lot of symbols, OK? You know, just symbols flying everywhere in the notes here. But what it is trying to convey is what I just explained. So I'm not sure exactly you know, how you can apply the method here you know, to kind of solve other problems, but I think the more you learn about how other people solve problems, the more you can incorporate those techniques into your own way of solving problems. Yep? Is this kind of, I mean, I guess an application, is this kind of like compression? Like if you were to be like, oh, like you map a picture to, of one instead of having like a string of integers, it's like one. So in a weird way, you can you can express uh, coordinates as single numbers, but you can recursively apply this. You can fold like a five-dimensional space to a single number, because you know it, it works. You know, you can because this approach can be done recursively. So if you have a four-dimensional space, you take any two of the dimensions, you fold it into one. And you have four dimensions, three dimensions left. And then you take any two of those, fold it into another one. Now you have two dimensions left. And then you fold those remaining two down, and then you have one single dimension left. So you can use a single number to convey the coordinate in any dimensional space. Well, it's interesting, but I'm not sure about the practicality of this. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to take row because I did set up the, uh, the row taking activity. I know we are at the end of the whole lecture already, and you guys are ready to get the whole weekend started. But it's still a good time to take row. Okay, so this is uh, the 13th. Unhide this. Um, why is it not letting me unhide it? Okay, well, that's okay. We'll... Okay, so I'll give you until, okay, fine, we'll say 6.30. Not that you guys would actually stay here till 6, 4.30 p.m. Okay, 
8.30 p.m. And then the uh, access code is SDF1. I think the entire class is too young to know what SDF1 stands for, but, it, but that's the access code. I'll explain later. That's what SDF1 stands for. It's Super Dimensional Fortress 1, which is the uh, code name of the spaceship in Macross, otherwise known as um, Robotech in the United States. Your parents may know about it. <laughs> okay. It's a Japanese anime from the 80s. But it was adopted into Robotech, you know, in the United States. So the reason why I chose this name is because you know in that anime, okay, the uh, the the faster than light you know, FTL transportation was done by folding dimensions, and that's what the G function does. It folds dimensions. So are we good with uh, the road taking stuff? That's Nobody gets into any issues with that one, okay? All right, so we are now done with the Aleph Null module already because that's the end of the Aleph Null module. So there are a few things, okay? There are the definitions, the functions, the inverse function, but I think it's also important you know, if you have the time to really kind of examine how the problem is solved. Yes? SDF1, SDF1. All right, well, you guys have a nice weekend. I will see all of you hopefully on Monday. And then we'll start to kind of talk about the exam one. So don't worry, exam one will always be at least a week away until I announce the practice exam. And then you are not gonna be around Oh, am I gonna be Two weeks? Yeah. Yeah, from uh, APAC. You might just have to have a key to 305. You have to have a key to 305. Yes. Can I get in really quickly? Yeah, sure. Give me a second. Let me turn off the recorder first.